which is good for him. That's good. All right. So you guys ready? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Tony, you're good? Okay, yeah. here we go. All right. Aloha, everyone. Welcome to Talk Story Unscripted. My name is Pete, and Doug is not here today. He's checking out an ultrasound. How good is that? But today, we have three members of the 70s band Love Song right here, coming to us live from the upper room in Southern California. Jay Truex, Tommy Coombs, and Chuck Gerard. So good to have you here. Guys, welcome to Talk Story. Pleasure. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's amazing. I can't believe we're in the same virtual room here. Um, you guys were really influential in my life. I was one of those young punks sitting out in the audience and listening to your incredible music. And you guys were in the center of what people are calling the incredible Jesus revolution. You know, it's not a big deal now, but back then, putting rock and roll music and Christian lyrics together, that's crazy. What were you guys thinking? How did that happen? Well, it was sort of a natural thing is the music that we, we had been, we were all professional musicians and we, uh, um, that's the music of our DNA, the music. We, I, I was in professional music for about 10 years before I became a Christian. And so when I became a Christian, I didn't think about changing my music style because I was a Christian. And now I should do gospel music. I just thought like, you know, hey, this is the music of my, my life. And now I have an eternal message to convey through it. So mm -hmm. it was just sort of a natural transition. It wasn't any really, we didn't sit in a back room and think, you know, drums are cool now. Let's do drums. And, you know, it's just who we were. That's from my perspective. Yeah. I mean, originally we were, uh, we met at a nightclub uh, back in like 67. And one of the guys in the, the band, the house band there started, he got into the Bible and, and I believe was, became a Christian, but uh, it was not a, like a church type Christian. It was a, uh, these were, it was, this was pretty uh, out there a little bit. Um, anyway, he cornered me one night and, and, uh, asked me, you know, I accepted Jesus. I mean, I, I said, I don't really know, but he, he just said, pray. And I prayed with him anyway, that I met Chuck through that whole situation. And we ended up coming together and having a band. And, uh, it was the early version of love song, like, like Chuck calls it pre-Christian. And, uh, we, that's where we wrote that song changes was back in 1967. And we wow. would play that in nightclubs. You know, I'm keeping close to Jesus. You know, that's the way it's got to be. I'm going through changes. That was, that was, we wrote that in 67. So uh, our whole life was kind of three years before we ever went to Calvary. We were going through this whole search deal. I mean, I lived on the North Shore, you know, where you are oh, wow, in the cool. Waimea in 68. And uh, just, I just went there with my Bible, you know, in five bucks. I had a one-way ticket and I just hitchhiked, you know, I mean, we went through a lot of stuff. We all kind of, Chuck and I both spent time in Hawaii back in those days, but uh, um, we were searching and uh, the lyrics kind of came from our, our deal. So, yeah. I came in a little bit later after the army. I was playing music with uh, Fred Field, who was one of the original members of Love Song and Chuck Butler, who went on to do Parable and Country Faith and all that. We got drafted in the army about the same time, got out the same time. First night I'm home, Fred or Chuck Butler calls me at my mom and dad's house and say, we're picking you up. You got to go see this band called Love Song playing at this bar called The Happening in Costa Mesa. <laughs> yeah. So it's just interesting how all these little stories of hearing other bands, we all wind up living together and coming to Christ about the same time. So you guys pull up to this little country church, right? And it's uh, Calvary Chapel and long hair, beards, you know, full on hippie mo moment, right? And then you meet with the pastor there, Chuck Smith, and you want to ask if you can play at, at the church. What was that like? Tell us about that moment. Well, we were living in South Laguna, California, right in the middle of the drug culture. I mean, Timothy O'Leary was right down the canyon, but we heard from a friend about this blue top motel and people our age who were finding God. And we heard about this hippie preacher and we church looking in church was not our radar for finding answers. You know, everybody was experimenting with a lot of, you know, foreign religions and mysticism, but we went down there and uh, we got Chuck Smith right instead of Lonnie that night. Uh, but we had been to Calvary Chapel a couple of times and it was just the very beginning. There was, wasn't that many people in there. We came back a few times. We were living in South Laguna 
and we're all coming to Christ. We go, we got to get out of the strud culture. And but we were writing songs, and I remember standing in the kitchen. We said, "I wonder if that pastor would let us play some of these songs." We, you know, he didn't know us personally, so we rolled up there in uh, with our guitars, and uh, he skeptic. He with a little skepticism, he said, uh, "Would you mind if I heard a couple of them?" <laughs> and we sat in the pews and said, "Welcome back." Now Chuck Smith wasn't the kind of guy to sit and cry. He wept and he said, "Can you come tonight?" He was one of the rare guys that actually saw that God was moving in a different way, in a different form that would have normally um, disturbed church folks. But I, I think, you know, between he and Kay, their hearts had been prepared. They were waiting on God. He told me years later he was just being kind. We came in, we came in well, he was hearing us out, you know, because he, he wanted to love on us. But he took us out to the sanctuary and that's our testimonies, as if I recall, how we came to know the Lord. Yeah. But he told me later when we did the 2010, we call it tourist, he says, when you guys came in, my, I wasn't going to let you on the platform. Long hair, guitars, drums, not going to happen. And then as Tommy said, we sang the song and kind of melted his heart. And the next thing we knew, we were playing that night. Yeah, there was there was a lot of long-haired people at that church at that time. I mean, people on the floor, people barefoot. I mean, it wasn't like your normal church at all. But there was so much love in that, that place. It was yeah. like this, it was a total love thing. I mean, it was just amazing. And so, uh, like, we'd been going there for a couple of weeks before we uh, got up the, the nerve to kind of <laughs> see if he'd let us play. But, uh, he, but only a couple of weeks. We were only about three weeks yeah. old in the Lord. Yeah. That was part of Chuck's hesitation was that we were such baby Christians. Yeah. yeah, he couldn't figure out how we could write songs in three weeks. But like I said, we've been doing this for three years uh, in, in different phases. But uh, it's, uh, it was all, all good. And then the rest is history. Basically, we became like, uh, we just, we were, uh, we moved from South Laguna to, to Fountain Valley. We lived above a garage. We, we got some pictures of this beautiful South Laguna, you know, lush. It's almost, it looks like almost like Hawaii. And then we're like in this barren field in this two-story apartment garage thing where we're upstairs with each one's got a corner with no furniture, just sleeping on the floor. But happier than we ever yeah, were. Yeah. yeah. And then we're, we're going out with Chuck, you know, like two or three times a day. He just call us and you know we bring our acoustic. We started with acoustic guitars. Yeah. Even though we had the electric yeah. stuff, we just basically just put all that stuff away. And um, in fact, uh, yeah. And so we we did acoustic music for quite a while. And but wow. we did we just traveled with Chuck. Did we did assemblies? We did all kinds of stuff. So were you kind of doing um, uh, clubs and that kind of thing and doing Christian music, or or was there was there a moment where you separated the two? And you said, no, we're yeah. going to go ahead and do that. What, tell, Chuck, tell us about that, that time when you guys decided. Well, it was, it was kind of an automatic thing. You know, we, we had been playing in clubs. In fact, one of the things we had to struggle with was what to call ourselves because we were love song when we were playing in clubs. And we thought, well, you know, maybe we're misrepresenting now by being love song. Maybe these kids will hear that we're at church and, then we realized what a good thing that was. We thought, well, you know, now we're born again, born again, and maybe some of those people from the clubs will come to see us at church. So we kind of flipped around on, at least from my perspective, yeah. Yeah. and we decided to call us, continue to call ourselves Love Song. And uh, but now we say now the band is born again. And the, but the transition was, very, uh, as far as I remember, almost instantaneous. Right? Yeah. I mean, yes. we just never yeah. played in clubs again. Well, we did a couple of times, couple of times. on evangelistic situations, yeah. but. Yeah, regularly yeah. just to have like gigs as we call them we didn't do that we anymore. never did that anymore yeah although we did wind up playing at the troubadour on sunset after that uh for it was a, like a showcase for Ahmed Erdogan and Clive Davis you know yeah. the two biggest record guys in the world uh but it's kind of funny if you did something like that a hundred people would come from the church yeah <laughs> to be there to salt and pepper the audience you know it, you know, our music was always about evangelism from that point on. I mean, worship was running parallel as well. But, okay, we found the answer finally after all the searching. And it wasn't where we thought we were going to find it. But now we feel like we got to tell our whole generation about Jesus in a language they understand. How are we going to do that? You know, we're not black gospel. We're not southern gospel. And we literally just said, I don't know how we're going to do it. We're just going to have to 
forge your own well, way. Yeah, it was basically we just we uh, we came from that whole drug culture, and and we with all our all our searching, and we could put that in our testimony. Yeah. And it was it was a way to communicate, you know, what people were going through, then how what what we found at the end, and uh, how uh, you know we just got you know put uh, set. Um, straight in the Bible with Chuck Smith. He was just the most awesome Bible teacher because we had so many things out of context. And in the old days, it was just, we were just reading the red letters in the New Testament. You know, that was what, wow. the, what Jesus said. The, our, the guy, our, our Bible teacher in those days just said everything else is, is, is bunk, basically. But, <laughs> quick, uh, story in this yeah. regard. quick story in this regard. I don't know how we got invited to this club called Pier 19 in Costa Mesa. We saw it as an evangelistic opportunity, so we, it was like in the after hours kind of, you'd go in and play, you know, I don't think there was alcohol being served at that time. So we thought, wow, this would be a great opportunity to witness to people. So we went in and we gave them full bore, you know, our Christian stuff. We didn't try to do, to dial it back at all, because we thought they'll never ask us back, so let's just do our thing. Well, about Wednesday, the next week, we get a phone call saying, can you guys come in this weekend? They loved you. Oh. So we started going down there regularly until, like Tommy said, the Calvary kids started to hear about yeah, it. So they would and come. they would come down. And we thought at yeah. first, well, that's kind of cool. We got a bunch of people witnessing yeah. in there. But then pretty soon we thought, well, these are young Christians yeah. like us. Maybe they'll be influenced the other way. And we stopped yeah. playing there. But it, yeah. was a, it was a cool thing for a while, you know. People say that bands lots of times are like dysfunctional families. So finish this sentence for me. Putting the love song band together was like, Tommy? Uh, friends coming across the line with going from darkness to light and a lot of joy. Mm -hmm. How about you, Chuck? Well, it was, it was a God thing. So mm -hmm. it was like being in this place where you are being pulled together with a people that you, you know, just sort of random connections that God designed in advance so that you could be this nucleus group. Because really there were a bunch of people that played that were in our hippie commune that were musicians, but it wound up to be fundamentally us four. So it was being in the middle of something divine that God was doing. No. And you really had like one of the lines I use is we we're a bunch of hippies in the right place at the right time. And that's kind of really what it was like yeah. for me. Yeah, there was the ones that quit doing drugs, and and uh, that, those that was basically the guys that became the band. It was it was not really planned; it just mm -hmm. kind of happened. I'm 17 years old. I start I start hearing about this thing that's happening down in Costa Mesa. So I go to this little country church on the edge of town. You like how I did that, All right? And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> smooth. <laughs> And uh, I show up and then there's Love Song playing and there's this massive crowd and there's just this, I think you mentioned it, there's this love there and there's something really special. I'm just, just thinking about it right, right now, it gives me goosebumps, you know, or as we say in Hawaii, chicken skin. And uh, you guys are up there playing. What was that like? What was the experience like playing with these crowds? Things start swelling, you know, they have to put up a tent, right? God really, truly uh, blessed us. I mean, we felt the presence of the Lord when we sang these songs. I mean, it was, and people could feel, I mean, I could, it was, it was a, it was a real deal. It wasn't like, I mean, it was real. For and, me, it was, it was kind of like being on this rocket ship. I mean, mm -hmm. it was so fast. The, the, the way our, our fame grew because we, we were benefiting from all the, the media started to come to Calvary and do all their stories on, hippies getting saved. And of course, we were the band that was featured in Life Magazine, Look Magazine, you know, Newsweek. And uh, it happened so fast. Those first few months, we were in the tent within like four months, we outgrew the, the little chapel. Yeah. And then that grew to 2000. So it, for me, part of it, my answer would be it was such a, a, a overnight rocket ship thing. It was like, not knowing how to really deal with it. Every day it was something new, something different. You walk into Calvary Chapel and the ABC network would be there setting up cameras to do a special. It was a rocking time. It was really a fun time. You know, when Pastor Chuck was in his last days and I went to visit him at the church, he was still preaching and I walked into his office and he just smiled at me. He said, Tommy, we got to ride the really big wave, didn't we? 
Mm -hmm. And so the surfers understand this. I mean, it wasn't something that was a strategy or a man-made that we did. We were out in the water and this big wave comes and we're riding this thing. It's like exactly. hanging on for dear life. Yeah, you know? Chuck yeah. was a surfer too. Yeah. Chuck Smith. That's right. So it was, I think what's important for everybody to remember is this was a powerful work of the Holy Spirit. Mm. And, and in some ways we're just falling in faith into the great unknown, but the excitement from all the kids and the kids would get saved, get delivered from drugs. Their parents would start getting saved, you know, wow. nominal church people. Mm. So it affected whole families and whole cities. And sometimes where the drug problem was the worst around the country is where God did his best work. Yeah. We were talking about that the other day, that when we, the darkest places that we ended up in is sometimes where God was the strongest. Yep. And uh, it was just amazing. Um, amazing. <laughs> we were talking about, we were at Daytona Beach in Florida during spring break. And it's back in the early 70s with Almond Brothers are playing down the beach. And it's, this place is just, it's really, it's darkness, darkness, darkness. And playing in rock concerts in Kansas when everyone's doing drugs and and we're singing about Jesus, and it's like it's like <laughs> it's just it was just heavy heavy stuff. And it was culturally relevant because yeah. we weren't there that far removed from that culture, so it wasn't strange to us. We knew what they were thinking, and I think especially some of Chuck's songs were so inviting. They didn't make you put your guard up. They, they allowed you to think and feel and consider, you know, how Jesus says, come let us reason together. Yeah. That's, they were reasonable. Yeah. That's great. It kind of reminds me, we just did a podcast with John Irwin, who's uh, producing that, uh, the Jesus revolution movie and all that. I think you right. guys were interviewed by them, by, by the group. But one thing he lives by is you have to earn the right to be heard. And it sounds like you guys as a band at that point in time, in that time in history, you earned the right to be heard. You were playing the music that was modern at that time, you know, and it, 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 it totally connected you with people. We were the only band. No. All of a sudden God was calling musicians like, you know, Paul Clark and Phil Kagi about the same time, although we didn't know about them and Joy Band and Country Faith and Way and Mustard Seed Faith and Odin, all Amazing, these people yeah. start showing up, you know, John and Lisa Wickham. Man, they just all of a sudden, Karen Lafferty wrote CQ first. They're just coming out of the bars and clubs and they're hearing about this thing and, and God's inspiring new songs with them. You know, so we were a part of it, you know, in some ways a focal point because we had been professional musicians before we got kind of drafted, you know. Expanding on Tommy's <laughs> issue of the culture, you know, uh, that's another thing we benefited from because the culture of the hippies was so ripe. The late, late mm -hmm. part of the 60s, from everybody I knew, we were following the Beatles, we were following Eastern philosophies, we were trying to figure it all out, and everything came crashing down about the end of 1969, and everybody's standing there thinking, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. And then we start hearing about Calvary Chapel. So I like to say, we had such phenomenal numbers at altar calls. We were just talking about it the other night. And uh, I mean, literally 60, 70% of an audience would come to the front to receive Jesus. And uh, so I like to say these kids were low hanging fruit because they were so ready. You know, they were just ready to drop off the tree right into the kingdom of God. So that's part of the reason there were those huge numbers. I remember the first time we went up to Vancouver, we had an altar call. It was the first time nobody responded, as mm. I remember. And we're wow. sitting there going like, what happened? But wow. it wasn't time in Vancouver. But here in the U.S. it was. And so it was part of the, the whole thing in God's timing is what I'm saying, is yeah. putting everything in position yeah. for, for this harvesting of the hippies was a, a, another providential God kind of thing. Yeah. And, and Pete, just one, one other thing I want to say is like, you know, people like Karen Lafferty and Rick Founds was 14 years old. He wrote Lord of Lift Him in High later along with this new birth experience became a new song that revolutionized the church as well because mm. it was all you know pipe organ you know piano choir very traditional hymn book and so these kids had this new song of thankfulness and love to to christ and, and the church didn't know what to do with that for for a little bit and then yeah. you know it took them about yeah. 10 years ago like oh yeah this i love you lord song this is great we can worship like this uh, obviously, there were people that were being uh, changed by all this. Can you guys think of any stories that you heard how your music influenced people? Uh, Jay, can you think of any? Mike McIntosh. That's a. It's kind of Ooh, a cool story. Uh, powerful. We played on campus at Orange Coast College, and uh, 
he was in the crowd. He just took LSD or something, and he thought he what blew his brains out or something. I mean, it, it was he was in kind of a state of a mental uh, well, something. A gun went off alongside of his head. An actual gun was fired, and he in his LSD thing, he thought the side of his head was blown off, but yet he was still alive. And he walked around for weeks in that state thinking wow. his head, the side of his head was blown off. So anyway, we're doing this concert and he, he basically comes forward and accepts the Lord at Orange Coast College. He was part of Maranatha in the initial He ran days. Maranatha for a while. Yeah, and he uh, he started with our, he put did the albums. He was one of the first guys that sold our, oh, our right. albums. He put them in his, he went out with a trunk full of albums and went to the all these bookstores there. You gotta have this album, you know, this is <laughs> when we had, had long hair and beards and Christian bookstores, you know. A lot of them had put our stuff under the counter in a brown bag, you know. So <laughs> that's that's I mean, a real story. Yeah, I know. So Michael W. Smith was 14 years old, living in like West Virginia's little town. He went into kind of a used hand-me-down clothing store. My town is really small where I'm from, and I remember walking up on Chestnut Street, and I walked into what I thought was just a sort of hands-down clothing store, and there was a record bin in there, and there was this album white album with a red Maranatha sign on the front and it said the everlasting living Jesus music concert and I and I looked at this cover and I turned the cover over and everybody had long hair and I'm going this is awesome <laughs> this is awesome and I took it home and I listened to it and I God's honest truth it wasn't but a month later that I walked down the aisle of my Baptist church and thought this is what God wants me to do for the rest of my life. How I was going to ever get there, I have no idea. I believe that was such a God thing. And I really believe in large part, really in some ways, I'm not really sure that I would be doing what I'm doing today if it hadn't been for Love Song and that record. And that record changed my life. Sometimes when you see somebody else doing something you haven't seen, we say call it a working model. Yeah. I, th I think that when you, you know, Res Band or Petra or anybody, people are like, oh, wow, I, I could do that. So that influenced a lot of people that we didn't even know about. Stephen and Curtis Chapman has told me stories about him and his brother. And so we've heard a lot of cool stories that we didn't know back in the day, you know, because you're doing what you're doing in faith. Yeah. And 40 years later, you find out, well, Stephen and Curtis Chapman, you know, a lot of guys were playing this song. Doing this documentary has been a revelation to me in that regard mm. because so many people that I had no idea, Don Moen and people that went on to do amazing things, mm. had some kind of an impact through our music, our album, or a concert. It's been astonishing to kind of hear these stories for me for the first time, not having a slightest idea. I knew that uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman had been influenced by us and a few others, but yeah. it, it, not bragging, but just what God has done with our ministry in the lives of the second and third generations. Exactly. We've come up with a, we come up with a category. We, we keep finding out these things and we kind of look at each other and go like, I did not know that. <laughs> we're, we're learning all kinds of stuff yeah. we didn't know. The one song that I so identified with was the song Little Pilgrim. And it's, it talks about, uh, that we are all like pilgrims, but we're looking down the wrong roads in life and we're meeting up with dead end after dead end after dead end. And although I was just 14 at the time, I had been searching down some of those roads. I was raised as a Roman Catholic, but I wanted to go beyond what, um, what I had seen in the Catholic Church, which had very little impact on my life as a young person. I was um, taking drugs at the time. I w had been living in Southeast Asia so I was looking down the roads of Hinduism, Buddhism, um, transcendental meditation, following the Beatles and so many of the cultural icons of the day and coming up completely empty. And when I heard that song, I felt like they were singing about me. You know, the Jesus People Movement and Love Song in particular, Mustard Seed Faith, you know, just that whole movement. God did an incredible thing in my family's life, uh, which has impacted me. And I remember my, my father, uh, he plays music as well. And I remember his seeing these bands proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and going, that's what I want to do. And I remember him going out and locally to these different towns and preaching the gospel. And I know it was inspired by the Jesus People Movement, Love Song, all the songs that came out of that. Really the desire to be led by the Spirit and to see lives change for Christ. So, so thankful for what God's done through Love Song. Um, I'm excited to 
to hopefully in some way be a part of what that did and continue that passing that torch along to somebody else. Well, here's something that maybe some, a lot of people don't know is you guys actually, you know, you're, you're, you're playing around America, but then all of a sudden your, your music starts going internationally. It hits the Philippine islands and you get a number one hit. So Nick, you guys did a tour there, right? Tell us about that. We uh, received this invitation from a, a missionary group called Far East Broadcasting that had heard our song on the radio and realized, put it together, that's one of Chuck Smith's groups from Calvary Chapel. Why don't we bring them over here and we'll have this big thing. We'll call it the Love Song Festival. And uh, we'll have it at Rizal Stadium, which is where the Beatles played four years earlier uh, wow. in Manila. And so they booked that, that uh, stadium and we played for five nights I think the stadium doesn't hold much more than 15,000, but we had it packed out every night in the field as well. And thousands of people coming to the front to uh, receive the Lord. One noontime deal we did at the University of the East, uh, it was kind of a a rainy, it was going to rain. So I was with one of the, uh, one of our guys there. uh, And uh, we were supposed to do a noontime concert at this at the university. Huge university. But I had to go with them and, and help cover all our stuff before it got all soaked because it was all outdoors. Oh, it wasn't wow. covered at all. So anyway, I'm doing that. These guys are waiting for me on stage and I come in the back and and come in and people don't really see me coming in, but then all of a sudden I'm thrusted up on the stage. There's about 80,000 people there. It's like oh five God. levels of all Filipinos. And I'm the only blonde haired, bearded guy in the whole country. <laughs> and uh, the place just erupts and screams and all this stuff. Anyway, we did this whole concert on a Pioneer stereo system and two little microphones. <laughs> and uh, the place went nuts. In fact, when we left, they had to have an army escort, like arm in arm, to, to create an aisle so we could get out. And girls, people are stabbing us with pins, trying to get autographs, pulling my hair, my beard. Oh, my goodness. Um, it was crazy. And we were the Beatles for, for a week. For a week, yeah. We really yeah. were. That's yep. what it was. It was That's great. But, of course, your message is a lot deeper and, and really about true love. That's so awesome, man. That's great. About 40 years later, we were playing Spirit West Coast in Del Mar, California, and this guy comes up to us who had been a missionary kid there. He hated living there. He came to that concert and got saved. Wow. So this is one of those I did not know that moments. So we have a photo with him. And I just go like, I love those stories. You know, it's like, I don't know who's out here. Right. Yeah. And, you know, he, and yeah. it's nice that he came up and told us that. So uh, one of the things that was interesting about that, it was Maranatha had just started. It was really small. So we were signed to a, a new label called Good News, which was distributed worldwide by United Artists. Right. That's part you know, that, that record went around the world to places we still haven't heard about uh, because there was a powerful distribution system. Well, one more quick thing about the Beatle thing. They kept telling us when they were booking us over there, you guys are bigger than the Beatles over here. And of course, you know, no yeah. one was bigger than the Beatles. But we got on the plane, everything was comp. So that's your first hint because they didn't know we were Christians. The song yeah. is kind of subtle. Yeah. Our yeah. band doesn't say it's a gospel band. So they thought it was a business opportunity. So the uh, Philippine Airlines comped our tickets. The Ambassador Hotel gave us our room. So we get on the plane, and the stewardess is coming by to get drink orders for you know before the plane takes off. And she gets to our row, and she goes, love song, Tommy, Jay. And we're going, <laughs> oh, man, they know us by name. We got off the plane. There were news cameras there uh, taking footage for the evening news. We went through the town to go to the hotel. There was a big 60 foot banner of us on the side of Rasal Stadium. So it really was a little bit like dipping our fingers into the, our feet into the water of the beetle land. Yeah. And knowing it was a little bit like to be the, like a little bit like it was to be the Beatles. Yeah. One other funny thing is like, you know, you gotta remember this is martial law. There's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes we don't know. In fact, Mike McIntosh was with us and he met us at the airport, he came up to me and said, don't say anything, follow me. You will not believe what's happening. So the first night we play the big stadium is jam packed and we're tired, you know, we come back to the hotel and they said, okay, guys, part of the deal for you getting free hotel rooms is you have to go up to the bar every night and play for this elite group of people. Oh my goodness. So, so they had, what, 60 or 100 people up there. Yeah, you know, just regular nightclub patrons. Yeah, just so we went, 
Wow, this is interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, Evangelism <laughs> time. Well, they had they had martial law, so everything closed at ten o'clock. That's right. You had to be in your place at ten o'clock. So yeah. the people just they would shelter at the hotel, and everybody hang out at the nightclub up on the top. It was like a penthouse nightclub. So how many Christians have sung to an audience of of rich people drinking martinis? <laughs> yeah, well, the the hotel manager got saved. The lady. That's right. And oh, that's she ended so up. Yeah, she got saved, and she ended up working for the, the Far East Broadcast. She did, for Doug Suffin. Yeah, yeah, that brought us wow. over there initially. So That's so cool. That was pretty that, cool. That wait, was, there's more. <laughs> oh, I bet there are. And that's actually what I want to bring up. Cause so, so all of a sudden, you guys are doing this documentary, or should we say rockumentary. And uh, we had Ron Strand on in our last podcast, and he told us a bit about it. But how excited is that for you guys to see that? And, and it sounds like you guys are learning the most out of doing this documentary, some of the influence that you've had. Tell us a bit about what, you know, what your feelings about this rockumentary. It's kind of like, you know, they're, they're coming out of the tunnel on the field and Madden goes, remember, don't worry about the, the blind horse, just keep loading the wagon. And so that's kind of where we're at. We're, we've never done this before. Yeah. And uh, so we're, we're doing all the stuff and we're, we just have faith that, that God's going to take care of all the financial stuff, the, the editing, the product, you know, how it's all going to come yeah. together. Cause we're doing the best we can. And uh, we've got a lot of stuff. You know, when you went on a family vacation, somebody threw a jigsaw puzzle with 500 pieces on the table. Yeah. Yeah. We got, we got all these nice pieces. <laughs> say, where did they go? You know? Yeah. So we're doing a little bit more filming hopefully next week. And then I, will be just about done. There may be a couple more people in Nashville, yeah. but yeah. we had a preview and people who came to the preview said, wow, this is so cool. We had, you know, like 20 year olds and 50 year olds. People were in the Jesus movement. People didn't know anything about it. Wide variety. Betty Hester was there to Pete Jacobson, his wife, Hanukkah from Children of the Day. Wow. Debbie Kurtner was there with her and me. But the, everybody said, about 80% of them said, we don't need to see so much of the concert of these 17 songs. We really want to see more of the old pictures, old yeah. video. Yeah. Tell us a story about how stuff happened. So we just tore it all apart and we're kind of... Uh, we started well, over. One yeah. of the things I'm hopeful for in this documentary is there's a lot, there's history out there on the Jesus movement, on the Jesus revolution. I don't even know what this Irwin Brothers movie will turn out to be, what focus they'll have or emphasis. But getting your story told from your perspective is a very important thing. And yeah. this is probably the yeah. only opportunity we'll ever have to do that. Yeah. So I'm hoping and praying we can keep it together and keep it straight, truthful and honest. And that at the end of it, it's going to be a very accurate representation, at least from our perspective, of a very important event, the Jesus revolution, the whole uh, thing that happened there with all the people coming to know the Lord and the revival, I guess you would call it. Yeah. So that's kind of exciting yeah. for me because, and again, uh, we're kind of doing it. So it's kind of weird putting your own story together, but, uh, yeah. but at least yeah. it's a great opportunity for us that otherwise a story that would not otherwise be told. I have just delivered my, I'll do a little plug. I have my life story coming out very shortly called rock and roll preacher. So that was my opportunity to tell my story from my perspective, in it's book, very important. In a book form. In a book. Right? Yeah, it's a book. Oh, that's awesome. Which he that's when, uh, when is that going to be out, Chuck? Well, I just delivered it for typesetting uh, like a week ago. And from what I'm told, it could be six to eight weeks. We could have actually a proof copy. And then it's just, you know, the, the digital part of it is pretty quick. Yeah. Getting printed copy. Like, I'm, I've never done a book before, so I really don't know the timeline. But I'd say uh, it's easy to say, what is this, uh, J July? Yeah, maybe in three months. We have it available. And what's the name of it again? Rock and Roll Preacher. That was the name that of one great. of my songs on my so first album. Back to this video on Love Song for a second. Part of what makes the story so powerful is when Don Moen and Michael W. Smith and these other people talk about where they were when they heard the music, what it did to them, how it spun them around, you know. Um, you know, Phil Kagey's in it, tons of people, Greg Glory's in it, some other pastors, Skip Heitzig, uh, a pastor named Tom Allen from Texas, telling the story about he's 17. A friend drags him to a church concert, and he was of the mindset, I'm called to ministry, but I, I don't think I can handle being in church, being a senior pastor, because they're so out of touch with the culture and the music is a big part of it. Yeah. And he hears this in Houston, and he said, oh, if these guys can do this kind of stuff in church here today, 
what kind of cool music could we have at a church that I pastor sometime? It was a real pivot point for him. So for me personally, a lot of the most powerful things is other people telling their stories. And I think one of the things we sure hope for is that this will be a document from some living witnesses, if you were just like John and the disciples of Jesus were living witnesses. They say, we saw it, we touched him, we had lunch with yeah. him. That's, that's the power of it. I mean, we're not just studying something that happened. Well, no, we were actually there. You were there. Yeah. So hopefully yeah. that'll impact other generations who are wondering, well, what happened and what, how does that apply to us? Yeah, yeah exactly. Cause I feel like, you know, sometimes, uh, People could think, oh, you guys are just reminiscing, you know, the, the good days are behind right. us. But that's not the right. case. I really feel, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like we could very well be coming into another movement of the Lord. Because if you look at our world situation right now, I'm just wondering if the, this generation, those young people right now will suddenly say, you know what? Nothing's working. I give up. What else is there? And I'm praying, as a matter of fact, I heard that there's something happening at Huntington Beach at the moment. That people are going yeah. down there and they're, they're getting saved. They're, they're getting baptized right, right away, uh, which is great. They didn't have to go through a 10-week baptism lesson. They're just getting baptized. I'm saying with Billy and Kathy Bastone, I opened up the Daily Pipe, a pilot, a Costa Mason newspaper. It's on the front page of the paper today. Oh, wow. That story about this couple that moved out from New York. Did anybody remember the name of it? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, but yeah, it's it's news, and they're going for it right in the middle of the pandemic, man. Yeah, and that's cool. What do you guys think? Do you guys think that there's a possibility? I know we don't know. We, you know, it's all totally up to the Lord. But what do you guys think? Do you see it as a, a big possibility that we would have another Jesus movement or another revival? Obviously, it's not going to look just like it did back in the in your t in our day in the '70s and stuff. But what do you guys think? Chuck. The Jesus movement was primarily a U.S. phenomenon. It did more of the music movement filtered out into Europe and stuff. But when yeah. I went over there as a solo artist, it wasn't really so much about the Jesus movement. It was about the music. Mm -hmm. So we often tend here in America to see things through our American lens. But, yeah. you know, it's going on all over the world. Persecution of the yeah. church, yep. uh, churches that are growing to a million so if you're really talking what you're talking about is what's going to happen here in America, I think primarily. And, and I think it will look different. I'll let the guys contribute their thoughts, but uh, you know, I don't think it will be exactly like what we have because what, what drove ours was the, the music and the hippie culture where a lot of people are on the same trip at the same time coming to that same point of disillusionment. I mean, it was like a real strange kind of uh, coming together of, a lot of different circumstances that cause that. And I don't know if we have that same thing in our culture today. So yeah, yeah. I think we'll have something going on, but I, I think it will look different. How about you, Jay? I hope so. I hope something happens. Uh, it, everything is just really messed up. And uh, we were talking about the other day that uh, when we were all hippies and stuff, uh, a counterculture, there wasn't really any talk of Republican or Democrat or no one really had political parties. You had, you had, it was just an overall, the government kind of doesn't really, uh, is not doing it, but uh, yeah. uh, nothing's really changed to that effect too much. But they now, both were bad, Republicans but, and but now it's But now it's very polarized, I think, yeah. and that's, that's one thing. And if it could ever become unpolarized, uh, I think that, you know, the young people are trying to find something. And, you know, right now it's mm. Black Lives Matter and all that, so... But uh, there's just so much weird stuff going on. Yeah. It's just, it's crazy. This COVID thing does pretty much was the icing on the, the cake, you know? Yeah. So yeah. when you think about yeah. the social unrest and the disillusionment of say the mid sixties into early seventies, uh, that, that was a grand experiment with a lot with different alternative lifestyles. We got the kind of the same thing going on. Yeah. I mean, people are really seriously thinking, well, oh, socialism might be an answer in the United States. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Or, you know, yeah. sexual confusion is rampant. I think people are experimenting with things, hoping to find an answer. That might be what is similar to the Jesus movement yeah. with yeah. Diff different things are driving that. Uh, the drug problem is just as bad as it's ever been, if not worse. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, how it's going to look 
Uh, Billy Graham and Bill Bright, when they did the Expo 72, they said it's not uncommon at all for revivals to be centered and powered by youth. And then the older people, you know, think about it when we were kids, Chuck Smith and some other families in the church. Uh, we have friends in El Paso over this way. When their kids got delivered from heroin and they saw the Jesus movement happen in El Paso specifically, this one guy we used to stay with, Will Davenport, he asked a, a spiritual leader, he said, well, what am I supposed to do now? And that person said, serve that movement, serve those kids, just be there as a facilitator. And maybe that's going to be our role, hopefully. Well, you guys, I, I could talk for days with you. I know you're busy. You're in the middle of working on, on this rockumentary. And, and uh, I just want to say, Tommy and Chuck and Jay, it's so good. I'm really honored to be in this room, this virtual room with you guys. I mean, you were definitely influential in my life. You guys need to come out. We talked to Ron about this. Uh, we, as a TV station, we're, we're praying about having a, a film festival, you know, where people bring in their movies and they get, they get uh, judged by a panel of people and so forth. But it would be awesome to show this rockumentary at the, at the event and then have you guys as a panel and, and share the experience. Sure. And let people know. It'd be great. You know, there's a community of people who I think are passionate about this. There seems to be a rising interest in this Jesus movement in those times yes. with great glory. Irwin Brothers, there's a lot of sources. People are curious. So we, we really need to involve the community in what we're doing. And we need your prayers. We need support to finish this. This is, we've been working on the film for three years. Yeah. And hopefully we're going to finish it by the end of this year. That's awesome. Yeah. So for those who are watching this and you would like to know more about the rockumentary and even contribute. Uh, donate to this. Uh, this would be a great, it's a nonprofit organization that's putting this together. So please uh, uh, use the uh, link on the screen right now and, and get involved. You guys who are watching this, you guys can actually be co-producers with these guys and see this come out. I'm exactly. excited about it, you know, because I, I think it's important to see. We, we're not going to make any money on this thing. <laughs> it's like we've all been pouring our lives into this and Ron Strand is and his wife, Kathy, have just, this was their vision and they poured a lot of their personal money into it. But now we're at a point where we really need to get the community involved. And I mean, really, some people could give a hundred bucks, some people can give a lot of money, but even if it's five and 10, yeah. if with a massive, this is the body of Christ. If we can come together as a body of Christ, we can get this done at a really quality level that we think will impact a lot of people. Yeah. So if you're not, if you're not making any money, even just that, you know, $5 might be sacrificial, but yep. it would, it could help us a lot. Absolutely. That's <laughs> correct. That's totally true. It's not about everybody giving the, this, the same amount, right. it's whatever you can do. And, and I, I think this is an important project and, and I'm hoping and praying that, you know, it gets done and, and of course it will, it'll get done. But more importantly, that you guys will be here at the uh, Kahlo Film Festival. Wouldn't that be great? It would just be great. To yeah. awesome. <laughs> I like that part. We talked about trying to ask for people to uh, kind of like uh, in a couple sentences, tell us a little bit about how, what happened when they first heard us or if they ever saw us live or, and if they have any photos or anything awesome. that, uh, that we would uh, be able to, uh, to use and uh, it would be awesome if people would respond. So if you're watching this and, and you have any old video or you want to just take your iPhone and just say, hey, I was there when Love Song, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is what happened in my yeah, life. Or, you know, yeah. Make sure you put the camera this way, right? And then just- <laughs> Right, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, put it on the best definition you can, et cetera, et cetera. And then send it to this link. Or if you have photos, like Jay's saying, if you have photos, send them to this link. And, uh, and if you're not sure how to do that, just, you know, connect with these guys with, with the, uh, with Ron and, uh, they'll get back with you and, and help you out. I love it. You know, I mean, really, when you think about it, the very start of love song was very grassroots and here you are, it's still grassroots. I love that about that. So thanks again, guys. I really appreciate you being on and, uh, everybody make sure you connect with these guys and until next time, Aloha. Come on, guys. We practice this. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Aloha. Aloha. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'll see you, buddy. I finally got it. <laughs> Little country church on the edge of town. People coming every day from miles around. For meetings and for Sunday school. And it's very. It's not.
Hey everybody, thanks so much for watching Talk Story Unscripted. Please subscribe, hit that button down below and the notification button as well and share it on your social media. We really appreciate it.